Good morning. We want to get this session started, and uh, thank you for all being for being here. So, my name is Eve Rice, and on behalf of the 50th Anniversary Planning Committee, uh, I want to welcome you back to Yale and to New Haven. For the past two years, it has been my great privilege to chair the committee planning for this anniversary celebration. <laughs> to be sure, this weekend has been a long time coming, but we are thrilled that it's here. I want to pause for a moment before we begin the main event to thank the literally dozens and dozens of classmates and the extraordinary staff at the Yale Alumni Association and Yale conferences and events, as well as the incredible array of individuals at Yale who have made this weekend and the 50th uh, anniversary po uh, projects possible. And of course, a big thank you too to the members of the 50th anniversary planning committee, women of the classes of 71, 72, and 73, whose names you will find in your programs. I want to offer heartfelt thanks as well to our panelists and speakers, many of whom have traveled very far to be with us this morning. When we sent the invitations to speak about a year and a half ago, almost to a person, they responded with a resounding yes. Clearly, something about this anniversary moment resonated with them, and we are enormously grateful for their partici participation. People often say in an effort like this that it takes a village, but this has been a little bit akin to a small city. <laughs> so thank you all. I also want to mention that we have some very special guests in the audience today, either this morning or through the weekend. At the risk of leaving out someone I really ought to mention, I will name only a few people here. Uh, I want to start with naming the incomparable First Lady of Yale, Marta Moret, wife of President Peter Salovey, um, who is not here this morning, but will join us later. And I want to acknowledge former President Rick Levin, who was president of Yale for two decades. <laughs> and Jane Levin, who has taught legions of Yale students, also here today. And Linda Lorimer, retired vice president and former trustee of Yale, who is also, more importantly right now, my co-chair in leading the 50 Women at Yale 150 year-long effort. That <laughs> that this gathering really has the privilege of kicking off. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Catherine Hill, if she's in the audience, the senior trustee of the Yale Corporation. She will be speaking um, on Saturday. So I think I will stop there, but you can recognize special guests by their purple tags on their name tags. You will undoubtedly remember some of them from our time at Yale, um, and others are people you will want to meet. So please, if you see a purple tag or the blue tag of the speakers, don't be afraid to strike up a conversation. As you will see in the printed program, there's a lot to do in the next few days. There are thought-provoking panels, campus tours, festive receptions and meals, and time to connect with classmates. However, and above all, we urge you to use this time on campus in the way that is most meaningful to you. We wish you a wonderful weekend and a memorable experience, and thank you for being here. I'd like to take a minute now to introduce President Peter Salovey, who will offer the weekend's opening remarks and introduce our esteemed panel. So, so Peter Salovey is the 23rd president of Yale University and the Chris Argerus Professor of Psychology at Yale. President Salovey first arrived in New Haven as a graduate student in psychology in the early 1980s. That's when he met his wife, Marta, uh, who at the time was a graduate student in the School of Public Health. For over three decades since, he and Marta have made Yale and New Haven their home. And during these years, President Salovey has been a teacher and mentor to scores of students. He is also a renowned researcher known for the development of a broad framework called emotional intelligence. In 
In addition, he has served the university in many important roles, including Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, Dean of Yale College, and Provost. Since becoming president in 2013, President Salovey has led Yale's aspirations to be the global research university most committed to teaching and learning. Notably, during his tenure, he opened two new residential colleges, expanded Yale College enrollment by 15%, the biggest um, enrollment expansion since guess who came to Yale. Um, he has also increased access to Yale education for students worldwide, regardless of their financial background. In addition, he has advanced innovative teaching, scholarship, and research on campus, and amplified Yale's partnerships in countries across Africa and other continents around the globe. All these efforts have been in keeping with Yale's mission to improve the world today and for future generations. Please join me in welcoming President Salovey to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am thrilled to see so many alumni and friends back on campus with us today. And it is really a privilege to officially welcome you to the first Women in Yale College, a 50th anniversary celebration. So as you know, this weekend is the first event in a year-long commemoration, marking 50 years of co-education in Yale College and 150 years of female students at the university. And so on behalf of the university, I'd like to recognize the dedicated volunteers who put this weekend's program together and who are planning events over the course of the entire academic year. You all know Eve Hart Rice, Yale College class of 1973, and uh, I just want to add my own thank you uh, to her for her hard work. She is a Yale trustee. She is chair of the 50th anniversary committee and has worked tirelessly to put together a truly impressive program. I want to thank uh, Linda Koch Lorimer, a 1977 graduate of Yale Law School and a retired vice president of the university, a former Yale trustee. She is the co-chair of the steering committee for uh, 50 women at Yale 150. And together, Eve and Linda have been working with a dedicated team of alumni and students and faculty and staff uh, to plan this entire year. So please join me in one more thank you uh, to Eve and to Linda and all who have made uh, this program possible and this year possible. So we're here to mark a moment of great significance in Yale's history. It's a history that you lived. It's a history that you helped make. It's a story of how Yale changed forever when a group of young women were willing to be the first. Now, to be clear, there had been women at Yale before. But as many alumni from the graduate and professional schools recall, everything changed when you, the first undergraduate women, arrived. You changed not only your college, but you changed the entire university. And it was not easy. There were obstacles. There were missed opportunities. There were mistakes. Your remarkable success at Yale, and ever since, is a testament to your strength, integrity, and talent. And it models resilience and self-reliance for our current students. In the past 50 years, Yale has continued to open its doors, open its doors wider, and to push the frontiers of knowledge and understanding further. One thing has led to another. Today, our students come from all 50 states, from over 120 countries around the world. The class of 2023 is the most diverse in Yale's history. Over half identify as a racial or ethnic minority, and altogether they speak more than 60 languages. One in five members of the first year class 
qualify for federal Pell Grants for low-income students. The number of Pell-eligible students has doubled in just five years. 17% this year are the first in their families to attend college. That's a 75% increase in five years. What they share in common is a desire to make the most of Yale's opportunities, to engage with new ideas, to make a difference in the lives of others, to shape the future of our world. And they look to you as role models. They see how you forged ahead in business, in law, science, the arts, many other fields. And in a world that was not always welcoming or accepting. They take inspiration in your accomplishments. All around us is the Yale you helped create 50 years ago. Because when you walked through Phelps Gate in 1969, you showed us that excellence is what matters and that it takes many different people to seek light and truth. That is your legacy. So this weekend is an opportunity, an opportunity for the entire Yale community to celebrate you and to celebrate the history that you helped make. It's a chance to hear and record your stories so that we can understand the changes you brought to Yale and to society. And it's about looking ahead as well to the great chapters yet to be written and to the history yet to be made. This weekend, this celebration is but a small measure of what Yale owes you, the trailblazers who led Yale into a new era. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for being here. But thank you especially for being the first. And now, to begin our program, what I'd like to do is welcome our distinguished moderator and panelists to the stage. Our moderator is Margaret Warner, Yale class of 1971. Margaret is a former chief global affairs correspondent of PBS NewsHour, a former member of the Yale Corporation, and a senior fellow at the Yale Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. She is joined by Brenda Jubin, who earned her PhD from Yale in 1973, and who served as a dean of Morse College from 1970 to 1973. Brenda is the former president of Brevis Press. Nancy Malkiel, professor of history emeritus at Princeton University and former dean of the college at Princeton, is the author of the book, Keep the Damn Women Out, which I hope you all have. Kurt Schmoke, Yale College class of 1971, is the president of the University of Baltimore. Kurt is the former mayor of Baltimore, former dean of Howard University School of Law, and a former member of Yale's Board of Trustees, the Yale Corporation. Gary Trudeau received his BA from Yale in 1970 and his MFA in 1973. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author and artist and creator of the comic strips Bull Tales and Doonesbury. John Wilkinson received his BA from Yale College in 1960 and his master's degree in education in 1963. John is the former associate dean and former dean of undergraduate affairs in Yale College and former secretary of the university. So please join me in welcoming, to the welcoming them to the stage and welcoming every one of you back to Yale. fellow panelists sit. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. I think we're all live. It's not on, my, it's not on. Not. I was told it Mine was is. on. No? Front. Pull it closer. Make it Hello? Mine's on. You're good. It's on. All right, I just have to put it closer. Thank you so much, Peter, for that great introduction. No. 
No, all right. I'm not, and I'm not in charge of sound. Can someone resolve this? <laughs> I mean, nobody's is working. Mine is. Yeah. Blowing it. It's like more of a conversation. How about that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. One more time, Peter. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And <laughs> it's great to be back here. I remember coming here often, on, was it a Wednesday night for the Yale Law School Film Society, such as it was. <laughs> um, and welcome, I'm glad uh, Peter introduced and, and let you know our panelists and why they're all here, because they all either were part of it, actually all were part of it in some way, decision making and execution. So t today we're really going to, you know, Yale have been since 1718 an all male institution. And then suddenly it seemed to people on the outside that in 1968, the corporation took a vote and voted to move towards coeducation. So today we're going to hear about how that happened and how different groups on campus felt about it, and then, of course, how it was carried out. And I'm going to start with John. Um, no, I'm going to start with Nancy. Forgive me. So, <laughs> so you've researched and written the definitive book on coeducation, not only here, but in several other Ivies. Uh, Princeton and Dartmouth, for sure. And um, there's so, let me just get right to the big question I have. There's been so much mythology about why Yale voted to go co-ed. What do you think the truth is? <laughs> no, but I mean, you I'm an historian. I'm not sure I'm in the business of truth, but I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> um, uh, I would say there are... Uh, two main reasons and one background uh, reasons. The main reasons which I'll describe are admissions, um, number one, and competition with Princeton, number two. Uh, the background is the context of the 1960s and all the changes uh, uh, underway in the 60s that meant that by the end of the decade, a place like Yale bore only passing resemblance to what it had been at the beginning of the decade. First, admissions. Um, what Yale experienced in the latter part of the 1960s, like Princeton, was that the best um, men in high schools, they called them the best boys, these best boys no longer wanted to go to all-male schools. Um, this is the point at which Harvard, which had been going neck and neck with Princeton and Yale in admissions up through the early 1960s, begins to pull away um, because there are girls up the street uh, at Radcliffe. And so Yale, like Princeton, decided that it was important to admit women, not because of a mission to educate women, not because of a moral commitment to equality for women, but rather because admitting women was a strategic move to enable Yale, like Princeton, to regain its hold on these best uh, boys. Yale, like Princeton, couldn't abide the notion that the best boys were not any longer as interested as they uh, had been in coming uh, to New Haven. Um, the competition with Princeton. Now, Kingman Brewster starts this off. Um, the Yale faculty, others at Yale, certainly the Yale Daily News, understand uh, in the early and mid-1960s that it would be a good thing to bring undergraduate women to New Haven. But uh, the president and the corporation were certainly uh, not uh, having any of that. However, the opportunity arose um, through a mutual connection for Kingman Brewster to begin exploring with Alan Simpson, the president of Vassar, the possibility of moving Vassar uh, from Poughkeepsie to New Haven. Um, and there was about a 10-month serious study uh, undertaken beginning, um, it was announced in December of 1966, very high level president, trustees, faculty, administrators of what would be involved in bringing Vassar uh, to uh, New Haven in some sort of coordinate relationship uh, with Yale. Uh, 
Now, Bob Goheen, the president of Princeton, finds out about this, and his response is to go up to Sarah Lawrence College and <laughs> begin talking to the president of Sarah Lawrence about the possibility of doing a study of moving Sarah Lawrence to Princeton. Sarah Lawrence says, no, thank you. Uh, Vassar eventually, of course, said no, thank you, but Sarah Lawrence says not even uh, a study. Princeton's more serious response to Vassar Yale was to commission a study of the, a data-driven analytic study of the uh, feasibility and desirability of co-education at Princeton, a study undertaken by Gardner Patterson, an economist in the Woodrow Wilson School. So after Vassar in November of 1967 says no thank you to Yale, Brewster says, well, we'll establish our own coordinate college for women. And he spends the next 10 months musing about what that might entail. Four-year undergraduate, that's one option. There were a number of others. And he wrote some position papers, but essentially nothing was happening. Now, the Patterson Report um, is completed, published in the Princeton Alumni Weekly at the end of September 1968. A copy comes to Brewster. He reads it and he sees that Princeton could be serious about co-education. <laughs> so from the end of September till the middle of November with no process and no planning, um, Brewster gets the Yale Corporation and the Yale faculty to vote in favor of co-education for September of 1969. Now, Princeton at this point is going through its very deliberate process oriented um, consultation with alumni all around the country. In January of 67, the Princeton trustees vote for co-education in principle, and they tell President Co Goheen to come back when he's ready and tell them how they're going, uh, how he'd like to do it. And he does that in late April of 1969, at which point, of course, Yale has already made its decisions on admits to the class of 73. Now, if Princeton had done what Princeton would normally do, the Princeton trustees in late April would have said, we're going to embark on co-education, we'll spend a lot of time getting organized for it, and we'll do it for September of 1970. But they couldn't do that because the women were coming to Yale in September of 1969. And so in late April of 1969, Princeton decides to bring women uh, in in the fall of 1969. Let me get uh, John Wilkinson in on this because you're going to take us behind the scenes. Of well, I, oh. I, I agree with Nancy completely. Yale had no plan and as a consequence had a flawed process, and we did it because the rumor in New Haven was that Princeton, in fact, was going to go co-educational in the fall of 1969. Now, I agree with Nancy's assessment of some of the reasons, but I, there, there are a couple others that I think were really very important. We then had a student body which had become, it reached its maturity, its majority began at eight, 18, rather than 21. The Yale students of that period were not going to let the administration tell them how they were going to live their lives. And the one thing that the Yale students wanted, all those, almost virtually all those men, they wanted Yale to be co-educational. And, and the, students, the students drove that with co-ed week and, and, and demonstrations and, and, and great insistence. And, and part of that reason, I'm convinced, was Yale was in the process, in its efforts to diversify, it discovered public schools in a big way. And we went from two-thirds private boarding to two-thirds public. All of those public school students and a lot of the day students had gone to co-educational institutions. They had never encountered single-sex education until they arrived at Yale. It was not something they regarded as normal or natural or acceptable. Now, I want to add one thing, and Nancy mentions this in her book, and I should say, if you haven't read it, get it's it great. And, and, and read it. It's a fantastic. It's not just Yale and the, and the Ivies. It's also the Seven Sisters. It deals with, with those institutions which already had coordinate colleges, and it has a wonderful section on, 
on Oxford and Cambridge and how, how they approach this. And the other book I want to recommend is Ann Perkins here. She's here. It, it, just, it just came out, and, it, and it's a wonderful book. And if you are, have an abiding interest in how these de decisions were made, these are the two books to read. Now, one of the things that struck me as I read... Oh, okay. One of the things that struck me as I read Nancy's book was that our institutions became co-educational for pragmatic reasons. These were not principal decisions. The only, the, these were not principal decisions. It's, these were pragmatic decisions. And it, I don't know of any president of any college or university who actually made the statement that Sir Eric Ashby of Clare College, Cambridge, said. The motivating force behind the college's willingness to lead on the issue, he said, was the grave and great inequality and injustice being done to women. This, this, was, this was not a statement that was being made in the United States. It was made, it was made in Cambridge. That's why I say. Interesting. So Gary and Kurt were undergraduates. Uh, you, you were in the transition. Gary, uh, class of 70, myself, uh, I'm sorry, myself also with Kurt in the class of 71. I know that I can't ask you to speak for all men undergraduates, but I'm, it's, or at least it's not fair, but I'm going to. Uh, Gary, I'll start with you because you were one class ahead. Was it as, as John describes? That, that there was this groundswell of, uh, from where you sat and, and sketched and wrote and... <laughs> uh, was there a groundswell among the, the student population? The Abs wanted. Absolutely, and, and uh, one of the most remarkable precursors to uh, women actually coming to Yale as, uh, as, as, as real students was when they came as fake students for uh, co-ed week. Um, and that was organized by an undergraduate. Um, when you think of the administration involved in bringing hundreds of, of girls and, and clearing out our rooms and making them available to women, it's quite, quite a remarkable achievement. But it, it really put a stake in the ground. And all of us, particularly, you know, I was coming off my 10th year of single-sex education, so... <laughs> It was quite a revelation to me, um, and I was so taken by it that I went to uh, Wellesley's uh, co-ed week where I was one of 50 men just to see what it would be like to be in the minority, and um, my, my first class there was an art class uh, uh, where I was asked to be the model. <laughs> um, uh, so, so I had a little taste of what it was like to be uh, a, a curiosity uh, uh, before, before the women did when they came. Um, but I was also, from my um, little bubble of, of, of prep school privilege, um, I was perfectly prepared to go through my 11th year of single-sex uh, education without, without uh, complaint. Uh, but when it became um, known that it was actually going to happen, I think that a great many of us thought, well, this is a new feature for Yale. It's not, I, 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 maybe, maybe folks like Kurt who actually joined the co-education committee and were, were intimately involved had a, had a different view, but I think um, most of us um, really saw it in terms of, of new dating opportunities or, <laughs> and uh, it was, it, was, it was something that, um, um, you know, happened all at once. Um, I, I've, I've, I sometimes think of co-education at Yale as a little bit like the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, it, it was something that was debated for decades, and um, then it was rushed forward all at once and uh, had, a, had a very bumpy rollout. And then once it happened and was a success, uh, everybody was angry on both sides be because it was a half measure. And people became really angry very quickly um, by, you know, halfway through the... the, the men and women. Men and women. Um, by uh, by the, 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 the small number. And, and I think the issue of social equity, that Yale had a responsibility to educate uh, 
women just out of fairness and for the good of society, that only kind of arrived, I would say, and I'm only speaking for my one year, mm -hmm. but that sort of began to become a, a, a very important issue about halfway through that first year of education. And Kurt, what about you? Yeah, uh, well, you Margaret, l let me first start by uh, noting there in our alma mater, there's a line that says, uh, um, how bright will seem through memory's haze. <laughs> On, on this matter, there is more haze than brightness for me. Uh, <laughs> but it was because of uh, reading uh, Nancy's book and, and Anne's uh, 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 back there that I started to have my memory uh, refreshed. And as Gary noted, uh, I was actually appointed to the first planning committee uh, it was called the Planning Committee for Coeducation, headed by uh, Elga Wasserman uh, at, at the time. And so you can blame me uh, for <laughs> some of the bumps uh, that occurred uh, in the uh, early years. But uh, Yale w was going through a, a quite a dramatic, uh, for, for Yale, a dramatic period of transition. Uh, at the time, as John mentioned, uh, in the, the 1950s here, uh, what passed for diversity uh, was a white male public school student from the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> so then in, in the 60s, uh, in the early uh, 60s, there were uh, a few African-American male uh, students uh, on, on campus. And I think, although uh, Sam Chauncey, who you'll hear from, I guess, at the later, will probably uh, explain more. I, I wasn't sure how I got appointed to the um, uh, committee, uh, co-education planning committee. I was a sophomore uh, at, at the time. I, I, honestly, I don't remember, but I think it was because, and, and Ann could probably give you more d uh, detail on this, that there was some sense that uh, Af an African-American male having gone through uh, a, a cultural change or lived through a cultural change uh, at, on, on campus might in some way give an indication, although race and gender are very different issues, uh, <laughs> but that might in some way add uh, to an insight about the change that was going to occur. To kind of, uh, how do you adapt to a, a cultural change that's going to occur uh, on campus? Um, Gary is absolutely right, though, that the, um, for most of the men here, it was overwhelming support. I mean, there are very few, uh, certainly no organized opposition uh, uh, to this. There was, uh, if my recollection, some irreverent uh, moments. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if some of you may remember the, the Yale band, um, the marching band, <laughs> Uh, one time did a, uh, their own statement about the potential merger uh, between uh, Yale and Vassar. Um, if, if you, I forget, yeah, yeah. you forgot about that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I won't explain it then. Uh, but in any event, it was an irreverent moment uh, that uh, when they, they commented on it. But the bottom line is that most of the, uh, the men were very uh, supportive. And, and we did, I think uh, the notes from the planning committee um, show that uh, generally my votes were on the right side of history. Um, Glad to hear that. <laughs> the, uh, there was a, an argument at one time in the early planning process about establishing a separate college at Yale uh, for women rather than having women in all of uh, the colleges and that, that was voted down. Um, but uh, a lot of debate, uh, a lot of, of planning and uh, I think um, the decisions that we made were the, the right one though the road was bumpy. <laughs> and some might disagree about the preparation but I want to get uh, Ms. Brenda uh, in this. Excuse me, Anna, Brenda Jubin. So you were a young philosophy instructor, and you taught both men, and then when it went co-ed, women, and you were named uh, the first woman ever to be the dean of a residential college. So how did it 
once the women arrived, what change did you detect, both as a teacher and as a sort of, you know, dorm uh, counselor and enforcer? Let me start back one step. I was also a graduate student at Yale. And graduate students at that point were really second-class citizens. Yale College was the center of the universe. The graduate, the graduate school was definitely peripheral to uh, the main thrust of the university. Within the graduate school, women were even worse off. We were all corralled into Helen Hadley Hall, that architectural masterpiece, <laughs> and we're told, among other things, that we had to wear skirts to go to the library, which most women found a little bit off. But that was Yale University Graduate School. When Yale became co-ed and when I was named dean, I became part of an entirely new universe. This was a community, a vibrant community of men and women. Yes, of course, there were bumps in the road and, you know, and there were a few men who wished me not to ever have been appointed, thank you very much. But in general, it was a vibrant, lively place. And I am personally very grateful for co-education because without that, I would probably still have been a third, fourth class citizen in the graduate school. Okay, now, when women came, yeah, I taught uh, in the philosophy department my first class with a woman, I had one woman in a class of mm, maybe 20. And I thought, oh dear. You know, I sort of hope that she's a really good student. And she wasn't. And I thought, well, that's too bad. Just get over it. And, and you know, she's going to be an average student. And why not have an average woman? Not every woman has to be, you know, superwoman. But in general, you know, I didn't have problems on the teaching front. Um, as far as, you know, being dean was concerned, I wish I had had all women in the sense that it would have freed up so much time. <laughs> you know, I spent all my time dealing with the men. But the men had all the problems. The men needed the dean's excuses. The men, you know, needed that recommendation for Harvard Law School, which they were never going to get into, but daddy said they had to apply anyway. So. This was basically my experience, in a nutshell. I so the men needed more, more hand-holding and guidance than the women? Much, much more. Much, much more. The women, the women who came in, first of all, of course, they were hand-picked. And so you had women who were you know, strong and bright and whatnot. But <coughs> they got there. And for instance, in Morse, we had the strangest assortment of women living together in an entryway. How they could ever get along was beside me, but they did. They got along fine. Nobody came saying, I have to move from this room because I can't stand X or Y. The man, on the other hand, would say, I have to be moved because he's too noisy and you know, I can't stand him anymore. So, you know, as I said, I, I would have had all the free time in the world. My dissertation would have been finished well in advance Years before. if I had had only women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Gary, jump in, yes. Can I comment on the, the, the superwoman um, label that the women got tagged with? I think I... Oh. guess you have to put the mic right up oh, in front okay, of you. Okay, I now. have to find that sweet spot. Is that, is that okay? Um, I just wanted to comment on the superwoman uh, label that... Who, who gave it to the... It was a Time magazine... New York Times, and, uh, I think. It, it, it was initially a little intimidating from, from, from a male perspective, but once, once the women arrived, uh, even though it was a, a, an infusion of, of high IQ individuals, what, most, um, was, what was most disruptive to the, to the male culture was the high EQ, um, that mm. the women just seemed um, more developmentally mature. <laughs> um, I always had the sense that they could see right through me, and <laughs> and and it, and it wasn't a pretty picture, and and so it was it was I I just that was the only way in which I I thought they were 
Um, actually, over time, I, I thought that was an, a, a tremendous contribution to the overall culture. Um, yeah. But difficult for some men, Kurt? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, but difficult for some men, do you agree, Kurt? Well, it's, you know, it's hard to, to generalize um, because the, uh, you know, our experiences were so different. Uh, when I came in, I came from a public high school that was all male, 4,000 all boys. Um, yeah, I know it's kind of weird, uh, <laughs> but but so this was not a shocking experience to me, and and also my experience uh, here was slightly different than some of my other colleagues because I came in a, as a football player, it's, so that was a traditional Yale institution. So I didn't feel a disconnect from the place the way uh, some of my uh, other uh, uh, colleagues did, and with re respect to um, uh, the women, um, well, I see the Congresswoman coming in now. I mean, I know that uh, <laughs> there, there, there definitely were some high-powered uh, people, but I didn't get a, a sense of that. Now, maybe I didn't because I didn't read Time Magazine at the time. <laughs> um, New York Times or whatever yeah. it was. But, but I did get a, a real sense of, of friendship and camaraderie um, and, uh, and, and not a disconnect that some others felt. So, John, oh, yeah. yes, go right ahead. I was going to ask uh, you. I agree. The uh, men were accustomed to being pampered, and they came to the old college dean's office all the time asking for help. The women who came came to tell us how to do our job. <laughs> And, and I, I remember the first time I had an undergraduate woman have a tear roll down her cheek. She was so embarrassed, and I pulled out a Kleenex, and I said, I have about 10 boxes of Kleenex here. I've been using them for years for men. Don't apologize for tears. <laughs> I, I, think, I don't think the women had any more or fewer problems than the men. I think the women were much more reluctant to express them. Could well have been. Uh, and, and I think that was part of the, part of the culture. The oh, I think the women closer. were much less uh, willing to express their issues and their problems than the men because they had come to this new strange place and they had to be resilient. Uh, and they were. So, so again, John, and also Nancy, what can you tell us about the selection process? I mean, over grades or something, but what was, I've heard, again, there's a lot of mythology about what Elga Wasserman was looking for in particular. Can anyone here shed light on it? Well, what, what uh, Elga and Sam Chauncey uh, clearly agreed on was that they were looking for something uh, beyond the credentials you might normally uh, expect in terms of um, academic achievement and leadership in high school. They were looking for people who were tough, who were gritty, who were resilient, who could in fact survive um, in this environment. And they were very explicit about that. And both of them uh, played a significant role in the review of uh, applications uh, for women. At Princeton, the phrase that was often used was um, uh, people who had been uh, American field service students abroad was one marker for the kind of uh, grit and ability to adjust to unfamiliar uh, circumstances. Um, the theory as enunciated by um, Wasserman and Chauncey was it is really going to take a lot of strength and adaptability for women to manage uh, at this institution. Yeah. Mark, I think the analogy that, that I had uh, to the process was the uh, selection of Jackie Robinson as the first African-American in, in Major League Baseball, that Branch Rickey, the, the uh, owner of the team, wasn't just looking for the best athlete. It was a combination of um, characteristics that they wanted and somebody who was going to be able to stand up to a tough environment as well as being a, a great athlete. So they were definitely looking for, you know, outstanding uh, academic achievement, but it was that plus 
uh, some characteristics. We're all going to be blushing in this auditorium, but anyway, Gary, you wanted to say something. Oh, you just looked <laughs> very, very interested. So John, anyone chime in on this? What was the thinking by, uh, behind the lack of preparation? I mean, I, I certainly... <laughs> Was their thinking? <laughs> I mean, we girls or women, we would have, there were no women's bathrooms, say, in this, well, there probably was in this building, but in most buildings. So you had to run back from class to your dorm room or suite to use the bathroom. The women who were very athletically minded were just stunned. Uh, I think Ann Perkins has a great anecdote about this in her book. You know, the young woman comes in and says, well, so um, I want to you know, join the hockey team and the varsity. And the director of athletics just looked dumbfounded. There have been no arrangements made for or anticipation that women athletes had the same aspirations as men and would need facilities that would, you know, serve them if they were going to be the superstars they wanted to be. So what was the thinking? <laughs> there was, <laughs> there might have been a lack of thinking. My, my wife, as a, a, a wealthy classmate who became a professor at, uh, at the University of SUNY uh, Stony Brook, who went to Oxford several years ago before they had become co-educational, and the fellows voted to make her an honorary man so, <laughs> so she could attend those events that the fellows, all of whom were male, attended. In some, as, I, as she told this story to us a few weeks ago, I thought, you know, with the lack of planning, we, we brought in 500 women and we treated them like honorary men. <laughs> uh, the planning took place largely, I'm sorry, Kurt, a lot of the planning took place after you were here uh, because we, it was a rush job. Uh, and uh, we probably should have had a couple of years of planning. But I don't think the undergraduate student body at that time would have permitted the administration to wait two years. But Nancy, didn't, didn't um, uh, Brewster actually set the terms when he said this is our R&D year, this is mm -hmm. where this is an experience? This is an experiment, and Gary, can you explain more, uh, more clearly? In I, I said my my understanding was that was that Brewster viewed uh, the first year of coeducation as as the R and D year. That it was it was the year in which uh, he expected to experiment, and and uh, I, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Kurt, but I think the the coeducation committee was supposed to be doing the field research and gathering the, the data and finding out what was good and what was bad and then reporting back to him. The problem was he didn't do anything with that report. <laughs> so uh, it was another two, two or three years before we were on the path to full education. To full, what do you want to add, Nancy? Well, if Brewster thought about this, I haven't found it in the written record. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he just figured yeah, I was going to do this, and it would work itself out uh, some way or another, and the women would get here and would help Yale figure out how to do this. But as Gary said, um, he was not interested in the reports uh, from the co-education uh, committee, and um, so it would just work itself out. Yeah, and uh, I think in both uh, Nancy's and Anne's book, that is demonstrated by the tension that uh, occurred between Kingman Brewster and Elba Wasserman. Um, she uh, tried her best not only to get these reports directly to him, but to elevate her status uh, at the uh, university. And he uh, continued to keep her a special assistant rather than as an associate dean or as a dean. Uh, or as a, a senior vice president. And so there was uh, a, a tension there. The other thing that, that's not really uh, captured in, in anything that I've read, the pressure that he was on, under by alumni and some trustees who were against this. Um, he had the votes on the, the corporation at, at one time with some major leaders 
to move this thing forward, but there was some real opposition um, and a question about uh, what that might mean for uh, the future financial uh, status of, of the place. And I know that that was a, a concern that he had, let's do it now and um, you know, ask forgiveness later. Yes, Nancy. Oh, which is in a way characteristic of the way Brewster operated on uh, other fronts. Would a, a really deliberate, careful planner have made the remark he made about the unlikelihood of a black revolutionary getting a fair trial um, in the United States? Would he have made the remarks he made about his opposition to the Vietnam War? Um, probably not if he was being careful and working not to stir up opposition, but Brewster was under attack from so many quarters uh, over his uh, stance on the war, stance on the Panthers, willingness to open the campus uh, to the demonstrators on uh, May Day, over his uh, unwillingness to uh, silence or fire William Sloan Coffin. So coeducation was just one other thing where people were really angry at him. And my sense is that because of alumni anger at Brewster on so many fronts, mm -hmm. his, his ability to maneuver on coeducation was more limited than it might have been if he had had a freer hand. Well, give us a sense of the alumni. Uh, I guess I'll turn to you, John, again. How fierce was the opposition? What form did it take? What was really the overriding objection? Well, because because of the lack of planning and, and, and because of the lack of planning and the immediacy of the decision, I think those who were very much in favor of coeducation were very pleasantly surprised. Those who were opposed to coeducation were very unpleasantly surprised. And and the opposition was more imagined than real. It didn't take very long for our alumni to think that, in fact, they had daughters who were going to get in deal. <laughs> and, I, I, and I understand full well why the presidents of these institutions were afraid of that, because sometimes the opposition was very vocal. But indeed, the opposition was not very deep. And did it, did it have a theme? Well, it was hard to sort it out at Yale because, as Nancy said, there were lots of other issues. Mm -hmm. We were dealing with Panthers. We were dealing with, with the Vietnam War. We were dealing with the, the changes in the, in, in the admissions decisions, the change in the demography of, of the undergraduate student body. So that, that, that there, were, there were a number of, of people coming out of that hornet's nest mad as hell at, at Kingman for a whole range of decisions. Coeducation was only one of them. And did it, did it abate after a year or two? Yes, thanks to the leadership of people like Fred Rose and Mel Chapin. And there were a number of alumni who stepped up to the front, mm -hmm. and, and they really took over and, 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 and created, the, created the Association of Yale Alumni, which became comprehensive and represented the entire university, including graduate students, <laughs> uh, and, and, and has flourished as a very supportive organization. You know, Mark, can I, I just want to say, you know, this, you have to put this in, in context about the change. Yale, um, look, I think that Yale didn't have its first Jewish corporation member until the late 60s. So this place, and when I was here, I was still listening to some old blues that were talking about Yale admitting too many people from New York. Mm. <laughs> Which was code, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there, there, there was serious opposition to, to this kind of change um, uh, going on. So I think it, it really has to be placed in context. It seems like kind of a, an easy, both hasty decision that he made, but um, I, it was pretty uh, dramatic and revolutionary for this place that was tied into such old ways. And as Brenda was mentioning about the, the college, I mean, the, the graduate school, I mean, it was kind of a peripheral thing here. Mm. Um, it, I think it, Rick and uh, Levin, and, you know, has helped 
uh, during his tenure here to make the entire university the place when you say Yale, it's not just the college, it, you know, the entire uh, university. But the, all those things that came about slowly. And so this was a very, very dramatic change for an institution that was kind of hidebound and, and looking mainly to the past. Margaret, could yes. I just say one yes. other thing? Because I think it, it really is important. I think it's really important to put this in the context. I mentioned earlier that the public school population doubled. The student of color population was doubling almost every year for over a five-year period. And the Jewish and Catholic population during that period doubled as well. So, so Yale, by the time you arrived, was a very, very different place from the one that I went to from 1956 to 1960. Did you want to jump in, Gary? Um, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you always look so, you, you, you know you look spellbound and as if you're on the verge of saying something. So I'll put you on the spot. I'm dying to ask. I don't recall... So I'm going to ask you, did bull tails deal with coeducation? To what degree was it good grist for bull tails? I tried to research this on Google, but it was hard to find. Well, I, I tried to research it too. <laughs> and, and I, I found, uh, I, I published two collections of, of bull tails when I was a student. And, and I, I dug out the, the second one. And um, the less we say about that, the better. Uh, <laughs> other than I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> Uh -oh. For whatever small, toxic contribution to your experience I made, <laughs> um, I, what preceded that? Uh, when I first started thinking about, well, what does this mean for us as, as satirists on the Yale Record, which is the, it still is the humor magazine, um, and we gathered here at Yale a few weeks early to, to try to get out an early issue about women coming to Yale, and um, uh, we, we uh, enlisted the help of uh, a friend of my mother's who was a professional uh, model, runway model. And she was like 5'11 and had three feet of blonde hair. And we thought, well, this is a perfect avatar for <laughs> the women that will be arriving. We put her on the cover as, as eye candy with two words, the girls. And then inside, we had four profiles of, of uh, supposedly uh, incoming uh, freshmen. And of course, we didn't know any, but we, you know, we, and we needed pictures. So, so we enlisted the help of our legacy girlfriends and uh, uh, who were all too happy to uh, make fun of, of the competition. So we, 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 <laughs> we took their pictures and we wrote profiles for them. And I, I can't imagine what it would have been like. You mean you didn't? We're making fun of them before we've met any of them. <laughs> And were these real women coming to Yale? No, 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 no. They were um. just girls we knew. And <laughs> so all babes, I so, imagine. Yeah. So that was my opening move. <laughs> and and uh, and and I, I, going back and looking at some of those those early strips, uh, the the, the I, there's no hiding it because it was in the the Welcome Center. There's a strip where Mike arrives. Uh, uh, in college and, and finds that through some error, in administrative error, he, his roommate is, is a woman. That was, you think, would set up uh, some pretty interesting storylines. Uh, uh, you would think would set up some pretty interesting storylines, but I think the less we talk about where that went, uh, <laughs> the, the better. I, I think the strip did become kind of a, a, a symbol of the old order in some people's minds, and, and I think I was rewarded for that by uh, being included in a book called uh, Women at Yale, which was written by two sociologists, uh, uh, grad students. Did, did you encounter that, Nancy, uh, uh, in your research? And it was written by two, two really interesting uh, sociology grad students named Pepper Schwartz and Janet Lever. And um, they were into sort of participatory field work. And so they actually went out on dates. They went to mixers. They went on road trips, um, they all matter of humiliation just to get a taste for it. And they um, interviewed a lot of, of Yale students, including myself. And um, I remember coming out of that interview, it must have been in January, halfway through the, uh, the year, and being very uncomfortable with my answers. They are the kind of answers I would have given a year earlier, two years earlier, and probably answers that were representative 
of a lot of Yale seniors at that time. And uh, I think, and again, you'll have to correct, correct me on the chronology, but I think the, there was a, a gathering, uh, there was a, some women's gathering in February, um, a conference. I'm in the midst of whatever time. It there was the yeah. invasion of the uh, alumni luncheon by the, the freshman women. Right, the disruption. The, well, at any rate, I, I, you know, this is something that, we, that I started thinking about. Remember, the women's movement only arrived on campus as the undergraduates did. I think if you had asked the typical uh, female undergraduate in the fall of 1969, are you a feminist? I think some of them would have had to think about it, and, and, and some of them might not have even known what, what that meant as a belief system. If you would ask them, do you think women should enjoy the same rights and opportunities as men? Well, that's a no-brainer. That's why they were there. That's how they got there. Um, but the actual um, creation of a movement of women reaching out to one another had not happened. It hadn't even happened on the campus. It was hard to find women's groups in the early and part, part of, of it their was experience. all the non-freshmen half of us didn't know one another because we were split up you know in different colleges so that that was in other words we hadn't had the old campus i guess bonding experience whatever you, you'd call it kurt were you about to add something no no, no. no it's just that that was a deliberate decision of the planning committee oh oh what was the deliberate decision of the planning uh, to make sure that women were in all the colleges rather than in a single college um, from for those who transferred as well as those who came in as freshmen. So in that, in the end, I, didn't Silliman have women or no? There wasn't. They all did. They all did. Yes. Uh, yes. There, there was a decision on the part of the president to, to make Trumbull College a oh. women's college. And he appeared before the Trumbull students who made sure that would not happen. <laughs> uh, and, it was, and it was understandable because Kingman graduated in 1941. From 1941 to 1968 at that point, or 69, the residential college system had come into its own. So people identified very strongly. In fact, I remember some of you, when you went to meetings in the hockey rink protesting one thing or another, you would introduce yourself not with a surname, You'd be Mary from Silliman, Helen from Trumbull. Uh, so the, the colleges had become very strong identifying places for our undergraduates. And when Kingman tried to take Trumbull away from the men, uh, they would not let it happen. So Brenda, talk a little bit more about what we're talking about here, the sort of social fabric, the, the, the community and the way it was organized. Because you probably had, am I right, a lot more students pouring out their heart or complaining than most would hear. Not so much about social life. Social life was like rooming, things that we overlooked, things that we overlooked. There was a double next to the dean's apartment. There was a, what? a double room next to the dean's apartment which actually turned into like the honeymoon suite. I am proud to announce, by the way, that all those couples who are still married, <laughs> who <laughs> occupied that, that double, but you know, <laughs> no, I was not hearing, you know, <laughs> sort of, oh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm having problems socially. As I said, the women just were not complaining. The men were not complaining so much socially as academically. Were um, there academic complaints? <laughs> About they, having women. That they weren't, that they weren't complaining about the women. They were complaining they couldn't do the work. <laughs> you know? The women didn't complain because they did the work. And you got to graduation, and it was like, you know, so-and-so woman, summa cum laude, so-and-so guy, barely squeaked by, uh, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, this, this was... I said, what I, I was so surprised, though, was that the women got along. I said, you, you just wouldn't have believed. And that, why that, did you think that was because surprising? They, because they were so different in terms of personality. I mean, you, you would not think that they could actually socialize. They could have lunch together. I mean, they lived next to each other. Well, wouldn't that be enough? I mean, if you really didn't like that one so much. But no, they, they seemed that to be... A bit. They made little groups, cohorts, 
um, and I guess felt comfortable that way. Um, so one change to the social life, of course, was dating and the road trip. And I'm going to ask Gary and Kurt to describe really. In I never went on a road trip while I was. There. <laughs> Ever. Ever. Gary. I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, would even hitchhike to Smith and those early mixers that, that I went to. But. Oh. <laughs> He's confessing that he did yeah, go on road trips. I did. Those, the, you know, there were there were mixers where busloads of of young women were were brought to Yale, and um, but there were also the mixers to which we were invited at at uh, women's campuses. And uh, no, it was a horror show. There's been. <laughs> it was a what? It was a horror show. I mean, there's there's no other way to describe it. And I and I was very, I was very shy, and and I was uh, uh, an art guy. Um, there's, I, I think. You know, there's uh, uh, one of the things that Yale did for me was that it made it okay to be an art guy. Um, there's, it's no accident that women have been at the art school for 150 years. I think that that uh, uh, art as a discipline was seen as soft, uh, unserious, and um, but it it allowed me to create a connection with the women friends that I made su subsequently in in my sophomore and junior year. And um, it was, it was uh, you know, it was something that, that, that you could find support for once you got to Yale. Because I'd been through all these seven years of, of, of macho prep, prep school culture. So it was, it was a bit of a relief. So I think now we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. And are, is someone moving around with the mic? Yes, yeah, so. Mark, can I ask Nancy, though? Um, in your experience, uh, the experience of women at Princeton, was it very different than the experience of women at Yale from just your studies? Uh, yeah, it, uh, and I say this not as a chauvinist uh, for Princeton, but it went somewhat better. Uh, it didn't go better in all the ways uh, that it didn't go well at Yale, which is to say you're the only woman in a class and the instructor asks you for the woman's point of view. You no, know, in literature or psychology, maybe, but in math and physics. Um, <laughs> it didn't go better in the sense that you know, a woman walks into a study room in the library and the large number of men there start giggling and she leaves and never goes back uh, again. It didn't go better in... So you're saying these things did happen Absolutely. The, all of that sort of thing happened at Princeton. All of the unease of the women when their great friend during the week brings a great friend from Smith or Wellesley on the weekend, all of that was descriptive of Princeton. The ways in which it went better um, are several. First of all, um, Princeton had 176 women, 170 women in the first year. Yale had 576. Now, you might say just 170 women. What that allowed was, first of all, we had the housing to accommodate the women, and then we quite quickly um, uh, acquired new living spaces. We turned the Princeton Inn, the hotel, into a, a dormitory, a residential college. Uh, we built new dormitories. So the intense crunch on housing space here where men and women were so overcrowded um, in uh, rooms meant for fewer students was not uh, the case uh, at Princeton. It went better at Princeton in that the woman hired as an assistant dean of students to work on the um, uh, development of coeducation, the acculturation of the women students, uh, was highly respected by the president, the provost, the dean of the college, the dean of students who listened to her, who acted on her recommendations. None of the marginalization uh, that Elga Wasserman um, experienced. And it went um, better at Princeton in the sense that this woman dean was able to get to know personally every single one 
of those 170 women students to listen to their stories and experiences and then to formulate institutional responses to improve the situation. As smart and effective uh, as Elga Wasserman was, she couldn't get to know 576 students uh, personally. And as has been said, certainly the president was not listening uh, to her uh, recommendations. So some, those are some of the ways in which I think um, it was easier at Princeton, which is pretty paradoxical. There is nothing in the history and traditions of that place that would lead you to believe that coeducation would have gone well. <laughs> <laughs> I remind you that Nancy's still at Princeton. <laughs> I mean, just so you know the institution well. So how are we doing questions here? All right, I think we'll go right here. And if you just introduce yourself and, and your year. Yeah, I'm Kelsey Kaufman, and I graduated in the 71. And so I love the opportunity of celebrating the past as a chance to think about discrimination today. There are hundreds of thousands of our sisters who are not welcome here at Yale and those are post-incarcerated women. A number of years ago, I started the college program at the Indiana Women's Prison, ran it for an, quite a number of years, still work with my former students. Um, when one of my outstanding students applied here to Yale University for graduate school, um, she, uh, her application was not so considered. So I, I meant to say, do you have a question? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> Kurt Smoke. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would love to hear you speak about parallels between discrimination against post-incarcerated people now compared to um, discrimination against women back in our era? Just real quick, though, um, uh, you know, my, my current job is a president of the University of Baltimore. We actually have a degree-granting program in the Jessup Correctional Institution um, right out, outside the city. And so we have take um, uh, young men who are in the, within three years of release and they are admitted to our uh, academic programs. And then when they release, they come on to our campus and to complete their degree. So we are reaching out to returning citizens and we do have a number of our professors who are also involved with women and who are incarcerated now. So I can't speak for Yale, but uh, I don't think that that should be a, uh, a barrier uh, to admissions, and uh, I'm sure uh, that uh, other alumni would support uh, making sure that that barrier doesn't exist. Another question. Um, yes, right there. Just you. I'm Leah Greenwald. I uh, am from the class of 72. Uh, could you, uh, where's Avi Soifer? Could you, Avi? where's Avi Soifer? I mean, my understanding. Hawaii, I I, he's in Hawaii. He's the dean of the law school in Hawaii. Right. But right this minute, I don't, is, I, I thought he was even going to be here. But my understanding from um, friends of mine in my class who were freshmen without women uh, was that, Avi did it all. And so now, you know, that's the impression of, a, of an undergraduate at the time. But perhaps you could add his, his role, uh, some, some information about his role in the lead up to the announcement that, okay, women come on in. Thanks. Kurt. Well, uh, Avi Seufer and Derek Scherer uh, did, did it all. Uh, uh, and in fact, it, in can you fact, just explain Derek, in a nutshell who they De were? Derek, Derek Shearer and Avi Soifer were the two who organized organized the uh, the uh, coeducation week, and and Avi also was a strong, strong advocate for coeducation. He probably was the most outspoken advocate for coeducation. And I'm sorry he's not here because he'd have a lot to say. And in, in Anne's in Anne's book in particular, um, there's a great a lot of information about Avi uh, there. I, I don't know, you know, whether he could have been here, but 
uh, if you'd like to know, you're absolutely right. He was a leader uh, in this effort, and I think it's captured pretty well in there. Right. I, I just want to say for a moment, Avi was invited. He sent his regrets. He invited, I'm not sure he may not regret this because there are how many people in the audience, but he said if any of you want to contact him, he'd be glad to hear from you. So, <laughs> um, But he was invited, and we're sorry he's not here. Thank you, Eve. Uh, the lady in the striped shirt, I think. No, that's she. I'm, I'm sorry, I met you. Thank you. Um, my name is Maggie Kuhn, class of 1973, Calhoun, Grace Hopper. Um, I'm hoping Ann Perkins is in the audience. Is she here? Uh, kind of as a follow-up, um, I had the distinct impression from reading your book that Kingman Brewster displayed a lot of resistance to co-education. And so I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more of your reflection on that, because I sort of got a little bit different impression from our panelists. If you're will, will, willing to comment. Sure. Um, I'm standing. The woman. I, I never met Kingman Brewster. He, had, he left before I came here as a freshman. But in, and in reading about him, I was so struck, and, and listening to those of you whom I interviewed about him, so struck by the admiration students had for him, his stands on the Vietnam War, which were incredibly courageous. Um, and, and I think I see them a little differently than you, Nancy, in that I think they were very thoughtful. He would go off and write his president's report on Martha's Vineyard and really think about the place of a university in welcoming students of color who had not been included at a place like Yale before, um, in taking stands on issues such as Vietnam. But I, I, I do think there was a blind spot when it came to women, and for me, the answer really lies in the incredible insularity of many of the men at Yale. So Gary has um, talked about how he had been at an all-male school for 11 years. So Brewster went from all-male prep school to all-male Yale to nearly all-male um, Harvard Law School back to Yale where he appointed all of his closest advisors as men who had gone to all male Yale, and the trustees were men who had gone to all Yale, male Yale. So there's no, and he marries a woman whose father went to all male Yale, and she went to Vassar. Um, so there's not an ability to see beyond that world of men, and I, I do think that that hampers him, and um, particularly this idea that Yale needed to have a quota, that hasn't come up yet today, but Yale needed to have a quota on the number of women because Yale's job is to produce leaders and yeah, a thousand male leaders. And because men are leaders and women are not, or so the reasoning went, why spend any spaces that you didn't have to on women? I, I love that as an example of the insularity, because if he had just looked out his window in Woodbridge Hall, he might have been able to see down to the law school where Marion Wright Edelman had graduated a number of years before, where Hilly Rodham had just started as a student, or down to the graduate school where Janet Yellen was getting her degree. So there, there were leaders at Yale, even when you, women leaders at Yale, even when you arrived, but I think that was hard for some of the men to see. Very interesting. Uh, I'm going to want to get someone from there, but first, yes, uh, with the uh, sort of Carl scarf. Hi, I'm Sarah Coffin, and I was in the class of 73, and I wanted to address this point a little bit on personal experience and ask the panel, too. Um, I had personal experience when I came here and went around with my brother on a tour given by Inc. Clark, um, and, who, and I asked him at the time, it was 68, I said, are you, I said, oh, this is perfect, I'm, I really want to go here, and he said, uh, I have the support of the president, and that's my thing, to me, we will go co-ed, I don't know, I don't 
think we're going to be able to do it in time for you. And then, of course, things got sped up. But I, he said, Kingman is for it. And um, I need, I, we just need a little more time. So to address that, I had this word from the director of admissions as a kid going around that he was saying he had the support of the president. But to the question I wanted to ask the panel is, maybe with those of you who've had experience of uh, the subsequent Yale after we were here, my impression has been that a lot of the dissatisfaction has been expressed by students who came after us, who expected Yale to be completely ready for women when they still weren't. And maybe this is 10 years out, or maybe even a little less. And at least from my own personal experience, I arrived, it was crazy fun. We all went into the bathroom the first time, and there were all these multiple colors, and there were urinals, and we said, great, that's their way of making the bathrooms for women. And you know, <laughs> it, was, it was funny. And we showed up, and at least I didn't particularly care if I was the only girl. And I guess we all knew we were in for an experiment. I'm sure other people had terrible moments, and I'm not saying they didn't. But I'm wondering if those of you who've been involved with the university, as I have in the arts, I have found that this sat dissatisfaction and the sound as if things were worse at Yale uh, than at Princeton. And I know the tennis team went down there and they were just, uh, you know, attacked by the men overnight in the same. I'm sorry, the uh, we can't so, quite hear you. What? No, so I'm saying that what is your impression about whether a lot of this dissatisfaction that's expressed about the early time is in fact retro thinking about interviewing women later? I mean, I try something. I have a daughter who graduated in the class of 1986, and a daughter-in-law got her PhD here in the year 2000. And I have to say that both of them loved their Yale experience. They felt totally accepted. My daughter then went on to the to the architecture school. Uh, Fifteen years later, Yale was truly coeducational. But I share with you, as, as one of the, I was in the class of 71, there was a sense that this was an adventure. And, and, and so maybe we didn't have the expectations that someone, even coming along five years later, would have, where Yale felt, women felt, you know, like we'd been added on, tacked on. Uh, yes, right here. Hi, I'm Marcia Eckerd, class of 71, J.E. <laughs> and um, I don't, I don't, I'm, this is more a question to everybody. I, um, I've been getting the impression, and it's perhaps it's because the class of 73 started out at Vanderbilt. And the rest of us were sort of, I sort of have this image that they took us like seeds and just threw us. <laughs> uh -huh. If you had a roommate who, uh, was a friend, you did develop a woman friend. My roommate was a white Black Panther, so she sort of went off. And um, so I have the feeling that there was more cohesiveness in the class of 73. I see here of a number of things that they did together, whereas frankly, I didn't really know other Can everybody Yale here her? until reunions. Okay. So I just wondered, is that anybody's impression that the, the class of 73 had slightly more, maybe not a lot, but slightly more experience together? Let's go to one person who was going to so answer this. I'm Emily Fine, class of 73 JE. Um, and yes, I think definitely there was a Vanderbilt cult that uh, kept us somewhat sane. But remember, all of you talk about experiment and how exciting it was, and yes, indeed it was, but we were 17 and 18. And it's, is it really fair to experiment on 17, 18 year old girls? <laughs> um, so that's question, yeah. that, that's remark number one. Sorry, it's not a question. Um, question number two is this morning to me is in some ways a metaphor for 69. You are having hundreds of women sit here for three hours with smaller bladders than men. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever arranges, I love you, Eve, 
did not uh, arrange a bathroom check unless you're all on Merbetric, but I'm not. So anyway, just that was just sort of a funny comment. I sort of said, aha, here we are. Not enough bathrooms for women in 69 and not enough bathroom breaks in today. But okay, that was Anyone just a sort of observation. Um, but I would like to say, oh, okay. uh, so over here, I, so but I would like to comment about, side. this is a question for the panel. So one of the things that's happened to me as a New Haven resident all these years is that people come up to me and say, now that there are you know, so many women at Yale, there certainly can't be a need for an office of women anymore, right? And so my question is, even though numbers may have increased, I still feel that just like I felt back then that although there was excitement about us coming, there really wasn't the support in terms of mentoring, there was no, I didn't feel like anyone reached out to see if I was surviving. I feel that even though women may be in fact in the numbers majority now, I don't know, that there's still so many specific issues as we all know about being female on campus and still a somewhat male dominated society. And I just feel like um, as the trailblazers here, it is our responsibility to still stay in touch with the, with the women's experiment. Thank you so yet. much. I, I'm gonna to go to, we have so many people with their hands up and we only have 15 minutes. Can I go? No, no we're I just, I have ignored. May I please? One more question. I'm Susan Cherniak Way, 1971 Calhoun. I knew President Peter when he was sporting a very nice mustache and hanging out at the Grad Professional Center way back when. I also came back to Yale and got my PhD uh, much later. One of the things that struck me when I first came to Yale is the lack of women faculty. I didn't realize at the time that overall, nationally, only one to two percent of faculty members were any university, uh, national average or women. But at Yale, it must have been point one or something like that. Coming from Barnard, it was a shock. And I wonder whether any thought went into increasing the number of women faculty to develop better parity with male faculty as a part of coeducation and a larger question looming over our get together. I remember hearing back then when I asked about why there were no women faculty, the answer was, well, they couldn't find enough women of quality of that level at the time to become faculty members at Yale. And now here we are 50 years later, and although 50% or maybe a bit more of the student population are women, we have come nowhere near that number in women faculty. So going back to the beginning, was any thought ever given to developing women faculty or future faculty members at Yale? Thank you. John, I'm handing this hot potato to you. Yeah, yeah, but that, 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 wasn't, that wasn't my job description. Uh, <laughs> but there was a lot of talk, and indeed there was movement. I mean, people like Brenda was teaching. There were but it was mostly, almost all at the junior ranks. There were efforts to appoint more adjunct women. There were lots of faculty wives who had their PhD from this institution. Uh, but there was no concerted, organized effort. Now there is, and it's a hard task. We've come a long way. We have a long, long way to go. What are the figures, John? Do you know? Pardon? A no, full-time tenured Peter faculty. Would know. I don't know what the numbers are now. So what is it now? It, uh, it, President Salovey is just saying every five years the ratio shifts. But you can really see the, the demographics shifting. So we, we break down the, uh, the gender ratio in, in five-year increments. And in the most recent years, the most recent hiring uh, there's essentially parity in many, many, many fields. But, um, but you have a lot of, um, uh, what's a euphemism? Very senior faculty where, where the ratios are very skewed still. And, uh, but as they move toward retirement, uh, you, can see, you can see the replacement. I don't have the current number. Uh, uh, Dean Chun is behind me and I can see he's on his cell phone looking it up. <laughs> yeah. Right now, maybe we'll have it before the session ends, but... Um, yeah, that's what, we're, that's what he's looking at, I think. 
So 36 percent in the in 36 percent tenured or tenured track in uh, arts and sciences. Right. It, so it better, tends better, better, but not there yet. Yeah. And uh, you know that that that's a process. That whole hiring process is one that uh, uh, is is really stuck in the 19th century um, because the 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 faculty and faculty uh, leadership is the, the primarily responsible for it. The president doesn't just you know hire, but uh, I know uh, during uh, President Levin's uh, tenure. Uh, and I'm sure uh, President Salovey is continuing, there are actually incentives uh, provided to the departments to go out and try their best to um, get around the, the traditional pattern of looking for people who look like you uh, to succeed you on, on the faculty. And uh, there was much more uh, diversity uh, because of those incentives that were provided. But my goodness, it is a, a very difficult uh, process to get uh, people to come out of the traditional uh, methods of selecting faculty, and that has been one of the reasons that's been so slow moving on the uh, uh, the issue of women and and as tenured faculty members. Yeah, that's that's true. We do have uh, incentives for hiring uh, women faculty in fields where women are underrepresented. Um, I should also uh, mention. Uh, Yale has 15 deans running professional schools uh, and, and the graduate school and uh, arts and sciences. And uh, with the appointment of Nancy Brown as our new dean of uh, the School of Medicine, she will start on February 1st, we now have eight out of 15 of those deans are women. So. My name is Diana Wasserman, and um, I graduated from medical school in 1977. I was admitted to the class of 73, um, but I'm speaking with another voice um, for somebody who isn't here, which was my mother, Elga Wasserman. <laughs> Thank you. She would be delighted. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple comments to make. Um, in anticipation of this weekend, I spent um, some time in her files and with my memories um, in the um, lead up to um, co-education, I was a senior in high school and very much interested in what was going on. I want to say, and, and this was um, stated in, in her um, oral histories, she got along well with Kingman Brewster. She respected him, and I think for the most part, he respected her. Um, he didn't know what he was getting when he hired Elga Wasserman. <laughs> they spent a year, or you can correct me, John, a couple years traveling around the country, speaking to alumni groups, and selling co-education. And she had quite a few stories to tell that year. Um, she also um, had an office over at Strathcona Hall where she did speak with many of you. And she spoke with people who worked for her, but also people who came with problems. And um, I know that, and, and she recorded this, that at one point um, a student come, came to her, and I don't know if, if that person is here, saying, you know, I don't know what to do. I spoke to my professor about starting a women's studies program, and he said, why would we want to do that? We might as well start a program on the history of dogs. And that, that was a, a, you know, not common, but 
there were those elements. And there were elements at Yale that did not want my mother to be a dean because it would demean um, the position of dean. My mother and father um, came to New Haven in 1948. And for those of you who, who were at Maury's last night, um, this is a repetition, but my dad um, got his PhD at Harvard in the lab of a Nobel laureate. And he came here, one of the first Jewish professors at Yale, um, as an instructor. My mother got her PhD at Harvard in the same lab of a Nobel laureate. Although she said he was very invested in her career until she got married. And then he figured um, that she wasn't serious about science. But there were women around who could be hired on the Yale faculty. And she, her um, efforts on behalf of faculty members and um, trying to get more faculty at Yale may have been why she didn't have a long-term position at Yale. I don't know, but um, I know that she felt very strongly about that. She felt very strongly about the fact that there needed to be more women and that the number of men would have to be reduced um, or new colleges would have to be built. So um, she was very fond of the people she worked with at Yale, um, many of whom you're hearing and will hear over the weekend. And it was wonderful to see John Wilkinson again, to see Sam Chauncey again. Um, and to remember when I um, would uh, come from school and meet her in her office, there were always women in the office, or all, always, and in subsequent years, always students um, who felt that that was a safe home for them. So thank you for your greeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for adding this, and I'm so glad I cut sight of you around the podium here. Um, Congresswoman Jackson Lee would like to say for something. For a moment. I'm going to talk about bathroom break, but... Um, oh, you are good. <laughs> uh, but let me add my appreciation to Elsa's beautiful daughter and uh, well, uh, well spoken. Um, she is our sh Shiro, and we thank you so very much. I like experiments. Um, I like being thrown into a boiling pot uh, and uh, survive it um, of either hot water or cold water. But let me rise particularly, I will speak this afternoon, to express my appreciation for the panel, uh, for my sisters, uh, fellow travelers, and um, uh, Kurt Smoke, uh, my uh, fellow shut the Yale campus down component, but keep it, but keep it. Gary, thank you for your continued humor uh, and uh, political satire that has made those of us in this life know what reality is. And John, <laughs> John, you were our lifeline. We appreciate it very much. I'm just going to make this, uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, President and officers, what I would like to say as a woman of color and to thank you to all of the uh, women who had the brilliant idea to bring us together so the bus driver could say that I didn't look like I had been here 50 years ago. That was pretty good. <laughs> um, let me clearly say, in the toxicity of which I live in, uh, in this world of uh, public service and this world of attempting uh, to reach America's promise, I valued uh, the uh, welcoming with its hills and valleys uh, that Yale had in diversity. In the midst of all of us was the beginning of the cultural diversity and the houses that now exist, that those of us who are alums who care about the African-American house and uh, those who are Latino, those who are Asian, uh, those who are a variety of uh, advocacies. So in the midst of all of that, we should realize as women, there were this uh, cultural outside world from the Vietnam War 
uh, to trials that were right down uh, from us, uh, those of us who were here in that summer or spring of 70, um, and a Kingman Brewster who came over on Pilgrim's Pride, meaning his ancestors, I came in a different boat, um, <laughs> was able to keep the stability um, while this experiment and while we were trying to find bathrooms while we were in class, and I, my children enjoy me saying that I had to run to my dorm to use the restroom. I think that's all right to be able to say. Um, but the experiment is what I hope as we proceed through this weekend uh, that we can reflect on uh, and even maybe leave this place I, as a person who deals with criminal justice reform uh, you have uh, you have touched my conscience, and so I'm running back now with a whole new idea about dealing with the talent uh, that we try to say get back into the community. I hope we'll have a chance to have a conversation. I'm delighted with your work, but the point is, I just want to end on the note of a, of appreciation of this whole weekend. Um, I have some trials and tribulations in the Congress. I have some trials and tribulations in my own district, but I thought it was important enough. Uh, to be able to come to get a better understanding of how we can utilize this experiment, even now, some five decades later, uh, in saying that diversity works, that empowering women works, that our ideas are important, and even today, in 2019, let it be very clear as we advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment in the United States Congress, in the America, United States of America, we haven't passed it yet. So I want to thank Yale for being willing to be in the fight, because you're still in the fight. Um, and I want to thank you for allowing the few women of color that came in that fall of 1969 uh, to have voices, to experience things that were unspeakable, some of us will talk about, uh, to experience discrimination, uh, to experience embracing, to find sisters that we had never interacted with before, uh, but to be able to attack this thing called diversity uh, and to realize that America's promise, not yet finished, was we were part of it. And what Yale was hoping to do, and I was hoping that they continue to do, is to stay part of the fight for America's promise. I went on too long. I know that you need a bathroom break, uh, but I'm delighted to see all of you. I'm trying to recognize folk. Uh, but you all look glamorous, fabulous. Thank you very much. Thank you all.